Hello and welcome to theCUBE's coverage of Open Source Summit North America 2023. I'm John Furrier, host of theCUBE's. We have exclusive news coverage here with Amazon Web Service AWS, David Nally, Director of Open Source Marketing with AWS here. Got some breaking news we're releasing today. David, thanks for coming on. Appreciate your busy schedule and uh, thanks for coming on. Thanks for making time for me. I appreciate that. You know, um, open, today source, we're... open source has been a great driver of innovation. We've seen it time and time again. Just every year it gets better and better. Now you're seeing cloud scale going next generation. You got a generative AI foundation models creating more and more innovation. Open source is going to continue to grow. You guys got some news. Let's just jump into it. You got Cedar announcement and you got Snap, um, Snap uh, change. Two big news items here in open source. Let's get into it. What is the release? What is the Cedar? product that you guys are launching? So Cedar is essentially a um, modeling tool. And so we're releasing both an SDK and a language for modeling permissions. And so you can do very fine grained permissions. You can do role-based access control. You can do attribute as, uh, access control. And this allows you to separate your authorization layer from the actual application code. Uh, this is something that we're already making use of in Amazon Verified Access and Amazon Verified Permissions. We're open sourcing the same tool that we're using internally uh, for that. We're doing that for a couple of reasons. We're really excited for folks to make use of it. We think that uh, this idea of having a, a, a platform to actually uh, manage access and authorization is, is very powerful. But we also want to make sure that people can go look at how we're doing things uh, for uh, both Amazon Verified Access and Amazon Verified Permissions, and that they can inspect that for themselves. So they'll have confidence that it actually is working and is working well. So authorization policy language, love the word policy, makes, make, makes everyone knows what that means. You're taking an open source project, to open source on the project, and you said it's used by AWS and your customers for the, what, yeah. AWS? Verified permissions and access managed service? Is that what it is? Yes, the, the two services that are already making use of this are Amazon Verified Access and Amazon Verified Permissions. Uh, and uh, you know we're open sourcing it because we, we think that uh, a lot of folks will be interested in that as well. So on GitHub, SDK, what's the transparency? Can you give a little more detail around what's being sure. released? How do people get, get involved? What's the next? Sure, one? so it is on GitHub both the SDK and the, the policy language itself. Uh, and yes, we welcome uh, pull requests. We welcome folks uh, playing with it. We've got uh, some demos uh, scripted in the blog post that, that's going live. Uh, I, I, I guess at the same time we're talking now. Uh, and so, you know, that, that blog post has uh, some, sample, some sample code that you can, uh, that you can actually run. Uh, we've done it in Python and Rust, so you can you can even start to try it out right from that blog post. Uh, we think that folks will start to uh, place that, uh, use that as a um, as a policy for uh, for controlling authorization. And specifically, we think that uh, because this gives you uh, that separation from application code, that it allows you a much more rigorous and easily verifiable uh, way to, to control authorization, to be able to do specific things or to access specific things. Uh, part of this comes out of our automated reasoning group. And we think a lot of automated reasoning because you know it, it's fine to put things down in code. And we think that, you know, that you can look at code and you can audit code and verify what's happening. But in addition to that, being able to uh, use logic, use formal methods to verify what is actually going to happen uh, is very powerful in getting assurances about how your code will actually operate in the real world and especially on some of those fringes. David, this brings up a conversation we've been having on theCUBE, uh, great length from the super compute layer to the cloud layer, to the app layer around this next generation architecture. You said a couple things, fine grained permission, access and control. You got the decoupling from the application code. And yet 
it's going to actually provide more value on, on, the, on the independence and auditing and analyzing things. I get that. What does that mean when you say um, it frees up the fine grained permission? What is that? What kind of permissions are different with this? What are some of the benefits? Can you explain some of these fine grained permissions and what's different than what's out there now? So specifically, people tend to hard code into their application uh, the access control and, uh, and all of the permissioning logic tends to go into the application. And that may be an ideal place for it to be in, in some cases, but we think that a more rigorous uh, a more rigorous way of thinking about that is to have a dedicated policy that you can apply across a number of resources that you can then go use some automated tooling to verify rather than trying to rebuild that every single time. And so uh, this allows you to model what you think your permissions uh, and your authorization layers should look like and then actually go verify it against your uh, against your application, so that you can have some uh, some type of assurance. You can you can essentially test uh, lots of scenarios uh, against this uh, this modeling and policy language to see if the policy actually holds true. So decoupling from the application also probably what frees up the application too, because uh, that that doesn't take overhead involved. Is that benefit too? Is that just a benefit of the decoupling? It, it's, a, it's a benefit of the decoupling, but you know the, the primary benefit is really the fact that this is something that is easily auditable. You can prove out that you know regular user does not have a way to get to administrative access via some logic flaw in your application. And uh, being able to audit that over time uh, and verify that, especially as applications change, as new features are developed, that that remains the case is very powerful. We just came back from RSA, big conversation around security, supply chain security. Developers are making the choices at the point of coding in the CICD pipeline, um, whether it's auditing for cost management, we're hearing a lot of FinOps conversations, also auditing from a security standpoint, all good, we love it. So that's the cloud, <laughs> that's what cloud does. The fact that it's open source is even better. So cool, check. The question that developers might have is, what assurances can you give the developers that the authorization decisions will be correct? What's some of the things, you mentioned re automated reasoning, what's going on behind the covers? What do you guys learn at, have learned at AWS that you're open source and give the developers the confidence that the decisions are going to be good? So I think one of the challenges that we have at, at any scale, and I, I mean that even at today's laptop scale, is that the potential combinations of any set of logic that appears in code can really be hard to exhaust all of the possible combinations. And so the idea behind automated reasoning is to use formal methods use uh, to use logic much like you would in a mathematical proof to essentially um, prove out that things will operate as intended and to do so with a degree of mathematical certainty uh, or tell us that we can't be mathematically certain about it and, and highlight highlight areas of risk that way and so uh, being able to use a lot of these formal methods uh, to, to actually verify that applications are going to work the right way, the way that you intended when you wrote them, uh, it, we think is very powerful. We use that a lot internally. Uh, you'll, see, you'll see that uh, you know, operating at the scale that AWS does brings lots of interesting edge cases. And so we use that to, uh, to create greater assurance that our services are going to work in the right way. And that's not just security, that's also that when you write a file, the file's going to be there. It's going to be the way that you intended it. And uh, automated reasoning essentially gives you a shortcut instead of testing every single permutation, which could take tens, hundreds of years, uh, that you can go look in a mathematical sense 
and prove via logic, prove via formal methods uh, that uh, that the behavior of the program is going to be as expected. I love the term automated reasoning, but the first thing that jumps in my head is AI, right? Because I think reasoning, I think all the buzz around large language models, foundation models, multimodal, a lot of AI machine learning being used in configurations, automation, like you said, it takes years to do things with lot, and then you got logic, I think metadata. So is there any AI in that, or is it just more the term automated reasoning is more of an internal process to the to Steeter uh, engine? So automated reasoning is actually a, a term of art around the specific type of logic uh, proofs that's going to happen. So not certainly not uh, artificial intelligence in the way that you would typically think about it. This is all about mathematical proofs and using logic to verify that code behaves in an expected way. On the AWS side, what did you guys learn? Obviously open sourcing something of significance here, big news. Um, what's the learnings inside AWS that you're bringing to open source? And how do people get involved? Are you guys looking for contributors? I'm assuming AWS will have some people working the project. Um, can you take us through some of the mechanics of what will happen post launch? What's the, the, the tactics? What's the plan? What's the goal? Sure, so obviously we are, we are happy to have folks contribute, play, file bug reports, help us uh, even improve documentation if they want. In many ways, we continue to develop this and plan to continue to develop this going forward because it's a crucial part of our infrastructure. But this is really just a part of our supply chain security perspective. We're making some tools that are available inside AWS uh, and we're making those available outside to the public as open source. We certainly care about continuing their development uh, we would welcome other people to join us. We think that this is a really interesting and compelling space to work in right now. And uh, you know, we're, we're focused on uh, delivering this value to our customers, but we'd certainly welcome folks participating from, uh, from the community to help drive what's important to them. Uh, we actually think that that will, seeing what is important to other folks you know, listening to our customers is is kind of core to how AWS operates and getting involved in the open source project itself is one of the fastest ways that we can collect feedback from our users and our customers. So you're investing in the software supply chain and other areas. Can you share some, some points of investment that AWS is doing in open source oh, foundations and projects? Yeah. You know, uh, we're here uh, today and, and it's Open SSF Day at, at uh, Open Source Summit. And so we're certainly a, a large investor in Open SSF. Uh, we, uh, we contributed two and a half million dollars to the Alpha Omega project. We're spending, uh, we're spending money focused on improving some of the package managers. So we've specifically recently engaged with the Rust Foundation on improving uh, the security of crates.io, as well as the Python Software Foundation uh, for their security efforts around the Python package index. So you know, we're, we're working on a couple of different angles. Some of them are improving the existing ecosystem. Some of it is releasing tools that we're using internally so that the rest of the world gets access to that tooling. And, uh, you know, we we are all just like everyone else in the te tech industry. We are all uh, greatly indebted to open source, and we have a vested interest in making the open source landscape far more secure. And there, and talk to the people out there that say that Amazon's not investing in in open source. I mean, that's kind of ridiculous. You guys are doing a lot of work. Uh, what do you say to those people out there who say, "Hey, Amazon just takes; they don't give"? What would you say to those folks? You know, the reality is that everyone benefits far more from open source than they could possibly ever give back. Uh, the the world, the technology landscape that we have today simply would not exist without open source. And that's true certainly for AWS. Well, I will tell you personally, you know, our generation, my generation, I remember when it was no open source, you had to steal software, you had to deal software, you got that copy of Unix. I mean, there was a doubt, there was a time when software wasn't free. And so- There was, you know, but the reality is, is that we are all today standing on the shoulders of giants. Yep. And that's certainly true. Uh, AWS certainly benefits from that. 
we're contributing in a lot of places where it's important to our customers. We're doing a lot of work uh, in Container D in the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, uh, spending time there. We recently contributed uh, Finch uh, as an open source project and uh, spent some time uh, building up some of that ecosystem that we depend upon, like Lima and Nerdcuddle, uh, where we're investing developer time there. We, uh, we're spending a lot of time in databases. So we've got a number of folks who are working in and around the Postgres community. Uh, and you'll see uh, things like the trusted language extensions for PostgreSQL, which we recently open sourced. Uh, so I, I think there's a lot coming out of, of that. You know, uh, there's, there's entire dedicated teams who are focused on specific upstream projects. Uh, we have folks who are working on uh, Java and OpenJDK, where there's an entire two pizza team yeah. that's uh, that's doing nothing but working on upstream. And we've got we've got a number of those size teams doing upstream work. Yeah. Uh, we don't we don't spend a lot of time uh, promoting every single commit that we that we ship. Uh, and so it, it may seem like we're a little quiet, but uh, <laughs> it's hard when you're running you know, the biggest cloud out there. With all that, all that work you guys do, and Amazon's web services cloud is massive. Its services are great, growing every day. The fact that you're open sourcing all your jewels—that's phenomenal. Uh, and by the way, the shoulders of giants is now the industry, and I think now more than ever, open source is the industry. You got business models. You got great licensing. It's permissive. You got more transparency than ever before. This is the industry. It's almost, you don't want to bet against open. That's, that is now a fact. Startups are coming out of it. So, you know, a testament to everyone involved. And, and again, I'm, sec I'm you know, always sharing that, that news. It's only getting better. We need it more than ever with AI now coming It's going to be interesting to see. So we'll get to that in, a, in another segment. I want to get to the second part of the news, if you don't mind. The sure. snap change uh, is, a first open source project to come out of an internal team at AWS called Find and Fix, full-time research yeah, securities. Take us through this announcement. What is Snap Change and take us through the story. Sure, so first this came out of an internal team that we call Find and Fix, or F2 if we're, if we're trying to abbreviate them. And the Find and Fix team is essentially proactive security where we're going and looking at uh, open source projects that are important to uh, AWS or its customers. We're doing security audits. We're trying to find problems in that. And one of the things that really sets these folks apart is they're not just trying to find problems, but they're also trying to submit patches back upstream when they find the problem. Because they know that maintainers have a lot on their plate and the last thing they need is someone dropping a uh, list of security vulnerabilities that have been found, and then they need to go scramble to figure out how to patch them. Yeah. And so they're doing both sides of this. They're doing some in, uh, initial remediation work to hopefully speed the security response from the open source project along. Uh, they've been doing that for a while. The, the, the teams existed for a while. Uh, a lot of the things that they're uncovering have taken a while to get fixed, uh, but in the course of this, uh, as part of their security research, they've had to build a lot of tools. And the first one that they're releasing is SnapChange, which is a, uh, a snapshot-based buzzing machine. And buzzing is essentially uh, really rapid testing of lots of inputs into, uh, into software to see where you can break things. And that's been responsible for the finding of a lot of security vulnerabilities over the past couple of years. Uh, it's, the basically thing that a, makes, it's a basically a zero day tool, isn't it? I'm all, uh, you know? Any you know? security tool can certainly be yeah. used offensively okay. as well. Well, explain and, and fuzzing, so, explain fuzzing. I think that I don't, it's out of my pay grade, so I have to ask what is fuzzing? And take us through that, because that sounds like it's a really cool tool. Sure, so fuzzing essentially uh, submits um, lots of different things into inputs into a program. And so uh, if, if you've seen the, the meme about, uh, about SQL injection around dropping tables and uh, uh, where, where someone names their child drop tables, semicolon Bobby and calling him little Bobby tables. Uh, this is doing something similar except at the application layer. It is submitting 
uh, untested strings. It's submitting uh, interesting data, trying to change the way that the program uh, operates. And it, it has been responsible for finding a lot of uh, security vulnerabilities of late. And uh, because you can automate it to a degree, you can, you can specify inputs, you can specify coverage. Uh, buzzing is a way to really scale uh, what used to be a, a very manual process in terms of, of testing applications. And this has been uh, used internally at AWS for the find and fix program. And you guys are open sourcing this as well. We are, we are open sourcing this tool. A um, couple of the interesting things, there, there are a number of uh, buzzing tools out there today. Uh, some of them require that you run uh, an application inside KVM and you have to use a modified or patched KVM or you have to be running special kernel modules. Uh, this works with a vanilla KVM and with a vanilla kernel. So you can basically spin up an Ubuntu image, run this and uh, no modifications required. And so, uh, we hope that that makes it easier and more approachable, uh, certainly faster. We've also focused on uh, trying to help parallelize this. So uh, a number of the tools that are available today, they only, um, they're really focused on running on a single core or a single set of cores. And this is designed to be able to scale out a little broad, more broadly. And we're hoping that, that that starts to speed some things up or make makes testing a little easier and, and less uh, less time intensive. That's great. I really appreciate taking the time to come in and talk about the news exclusive here on theCUBE. Final question to wrap us home, bring us home and wrap it up. What do you hope the outcome is from the open sourcing of these projects, Cedar and SnapChange? What do you what do you hope that has what's the outcome you're looking for, David, in the in the community? You know, specifically, I, I hope that as we release open source tools that people take advantage of them. I believe that a rising tide raises all boats. And so, uh, you know, this is this is additional uh, tooling that people can make use of and in this specific arena to make them more secure. We hope that this helps the open source uh, supply chain landscape be more secure. I really appreciate it. Great stuff, bring in the Amazon. AWS, Amazonian way, the internal team, fix and find, love that story. Open sourcing verification and fine grain access and control. Certainly there's no more perimeter. The cloud models here is only growing. So having those access authorization and verification controls is key. David, thank you so much for sharing the, the news here on theCUBE. Thank you so much for having me. I, I was really excited to, to tell you about these things and I appreciate the time. Yep, we'll, yep, we'll see you around. Thanks for coming. Check it out, Open Source Summit 2023 coverage. I'm John Furrier, the host of theCUBE on the show floor in Vancouver for three days of wall-to-wall -wall coverage. Thanks for watching.